Have you ever had a headache that was so relentless, so excruciating that you thought, this is it, this is the end, I cannot take another moment of this pain? Well, picture this, you're right in the middle of that horrible headache, your head feels like it's been pummeled over and over by a jackhammer, you can't see straight, you can't eat, you can't walk, so eventually you find yourself going from the hospital onto an operating table with a team of doctors getting ready to cut away at your head to see what's going on. So bzz, bzz, take a little piece, open you up and take a look inside only to be met with sheer terror and disbelief because what they found not only defies all human and scientific logic, it also might make you never eat a vegetable again. Hi, hello, salutations, ni hao, konnichiwa, how are you my friends? Welcome to the sus bowl, a place where everything and everyone is sus, maybe even us. Come on in, the water's fine. So welcome back. This is where instead of extensive deep dives like we do on my main channel here, we belly flop into shallower waters with creepy, bizarre, mind bending stories that make you tilt your head and think, what the f so if you wanna get weird, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications as we dive in to the cesspool. Okay, today we're gonna to take a dip into a story that truly did not go down the way I expected it to at all. That's also true for the poor, poor woman at the center of the story, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. Trust me, you're gonna to wanna to wait till the end. Your mind will be blown. Pun intended. Okay, sorry. Now real quick, a huge thank you to our sponsor and then we'll dive right into this creepy story. So I don't know about you, but sticking to a morning routine is sometimes really hard. It's like there are always a hundred things that suddenly pop up and need to get done. So I put off some of those small self-care things like, you know, making the bed, doing some stretching, moisturizing my face, which would just kind of throw off the rest of my day. So I've really been trying to prioritize some self-care moments with things that don't take a lot of time. And one of the best ways is wearing my favorite fragrance. Quick spritz can go a long way to making you feel a little pampered while everything else is chaos. And that's why Scentbird is my favorite. Scentbird is reimagining everything about how people discover, shop for, and experience fragrances, giving you full control on how you express yourself. So Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month, so there are no surprises. They have perfumes, colognes, lots of unisex options, and we are talking designer, honey. Scentbird carries brands like Prada, Gucci, Versace, and and niche brands like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of a Rebel. And with each fragrance, you get a full 30-day supply so you can try them out before committing to a full-size bottle. Or you could do like me and switch it out every month to keep it sassy. <laughs> and they come in these super cute, really large vials. You simply just pull the magnets apart to open and remove the vial or place it back inside. Snap to close and just twist the top to unlock the vial and spray and twist back to lock. So this month I received three amazing fragrances. I got Whispers of Truth by House of Salage. Oh my gosh, that smells so good. It's like this very bright, juicy scent with notes of grapefruit, bergamot, rose, jasmine, and caramel. I also got Love Me, the Onyx Parfum by Two. Oh my gosh, this smells so good. This has like a very kind of floral, fruity scent with this exquisite notes of like hazelnut, peony, vanilla, and sandalwood. Oh. <laughs> So join me on your self-care journey and tap the link in the description to check out Scentbird and use code SWOOP255 to get 55% off of Scentbird. Or you can scan the QR code on screen to get 55% off your first month. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. That is such an amazing deal. So tap the link or scan the code and treat yourself to the luxury and self-care that you deserve. Okay, back to the dock. Okay, let me set the scene. It's January 2021 in New South Wales, Australia. Now for anybody listening that's never been south of the equator before, that means it's summertime. It was a relatively warm day, high 70s, clear sky, a perfect day to go foraging in the woods if you're into that Peter Pan sort of shit which is exactly what the woman at the center of our story did. A woman, I'm gonna call Lucy because she has never disclosed her identity with the general public. Now, according to numerous sources, Lucy was 64 years old and was originally from England before deciding she wanted to see the world as a younger woman. Now, when she was in her 30s and 40s, she went everywhere from South Africa to Asia and then back to Europe before she settled down in New South Wales, Australia, just 
just southeast of Canberra and the Australian Capital Territory. From what little we know about Lucy, we know one thing for sure. Lucy was adventurous. Now, despite a medical history consisting of diabetes, hyperthyroidism, and depression, Lucy had a natural sense of wanderlust. But at the age of 64, Lucy had settled down into a more quiet life in a small lakeside community. Sounds quaint. But this didn't satisfy her adventurous spirit though, since Lucy decided one day she was going to gather some food from the land to eat for herself. Now listen, okay, I know this is a totally normal thing, eating nature's food and all. I mean, we do it with our produce from the grocery store. But in my opinion, like L Lucy got some brass balls, okay? Like it would take a whole ass Armageddon for me to feel like I could just pluck some berries off of a random tree and eat them and not be terrified of like stupidly poisoning myself because I'm out of my element, Donnie. Donnie, you're out of your element. And know nothing about what the hell I'm doing, but not Lucy, no. She's a brave one. And it wasn't really such a bad idea anyway, since the lake Lucy lived near was overrun with something called Warrigal Greens. Today, you're likely to find Warrigal Greens on the menu of top-end restaurants. Now, for those of you out there who aren't adventurous foodies, Warrigal Greens are a heavily invasive flowering plant, also known as New Zealand spinach due to its nutritional qualities being discovered back in the 1700s during Captain James Cook's expedition to Australia. Australia and New Zealand on the HMS Endeavour. Back then it was discovered that consuming New Zealand spinach could help fight off scurvy, which was like incredibly helpful for pirates and sailors and uh, I don't know anyone that wants to live. Back then things were shit was wild back then. Now fortunately, Warrigal greens are incredibly easy to find. They're native to coastal areas in South Australia and are relatively wind and exposure resistant. On top of that, it can grow in practically any soil type, meaning that there is little to no chance that you won't come across some when kind of backpacking through coastal or rivered areas in Australia. So on top of all of that, great sources of vitamin K, C, and B6. Yeah, Warrigal Greens, bitch is good for you, okay? Enjoy. Which is why our gal Lucy had no trouble whatsoever foraging for Warrigal Greens that summer day in 2021. And yeah, sure, I know a lot of the chronically online are out there screaming, you know, other than the venomous spiders and snakes and shit swoop and I hear you. Now, thankfully I've been assured by my team that there hasn't actually been a death from a spider bite in Australia since the 70s and the only snakes indigenous to the lake that Lucy lived near was the non-venomous carpet python. And I say my team here because I absolutely refuse, I mean refuse to research spiders because then I'll be forced to look at pictures of spiders and spiders are the actual spawn of Satan. I am fighting anyone who disagrees with me on that, but I digress. So essentially that's all that like Lucy really had to worry about, right? Like carpet pythons, like feedly dee, hoo hoo, whatever. So she gathered her greens and she went home and made a healthy vitamin C packed dinner. Now I have no idea what the dinner was, but I really hope that she liked it because it was the last enjoyable dinner she had for a very long time long time. Almost immediately after Lucy's foraging expedition, things didn't sit right with her, literally, and she developed a sharp pain in her abdomen and a terrible case of diarrhea. Uh, Lucy probably assumed that she didn't cook her greens properly or that the meal didn't sit well with her or maybe she forgot to wash her hands properly after grabbing them. Either way, she seemingly assumed the pain would pass and she went on with her day, except that the abdominal I can't even say the abdominal. Dominable. <laughs> Abdo I keep saying abdominal, like the abominable snowman, the abdominal, the abdominal pain never stopped and neither did the diarrhea. For three straight weeks, Lucy was in an incredible amount of pain that wasn't going away. And even worse, she developed a heavy dry cough and a nasty case of night sweats. Something was really wrong. So she went to a local hospital and got a CT scan that revealed the following, quote, multifocal pulmonary opacities with surrounding ground glass changes as well as heptic and splenic lesions, bronchorelic, a word I can't pronounce, lavage revealed 30% eosinophils without evidence of malignancy or a bunch of other words I also can't pronounce. Okay, but what the hell does all of that mean? In short, it means they diagnosed her with pneumonia. 
See, why didn't they just say that to begin with? I just like, you could have just said pneumonia. Okay, let me, let me shut up, let me back to it. So specifically, it was eosinophilic pneumonia that they couldn't identify the origin of. Lucy was given some medicine and sent on her way. And I highly doubt any of the doctors would have ever thought of this again if Lucy hadn't shown up again three weeks later, much worse than before the poor thing. Now, this time Lucy has a fever on top of all her other ailments and had been experiencing a fever off and on for the entirety of the three weeks. Doctors did a biopsy on a lung specimen and were confused for a number of reasons. Her symptoms were all over the charts, like consistent only partially with a rare kind of pneumonia known as eosinophilic pneumonia, which is a rare group of infections that can affect your lungs. When a certain type of white blood cells kind of build up in your lungs and blood creating inflammation and potentially long-term damage. The potential causes are smoking, uh, allergic reactions, and parasitic infections. Now, it's important to note that I have no idea if Lucy smoked or had ever smoked before, though her medical records don't mention it. They also don't mention any known allergies, which leaves just one thing on that list, parasitic infections, something doctors did not find during Lucy's recent trip to the hospital. So they were stumped, right? Like what, what's going on with this lady? And over the span of the following year, Lucy did not get better, like things were bad and nobody knew why. Uh, like just, I don't know, like poor Lucy, man. Undiagnosed medical issues are the absolute worst. So then in 2022, things went from bad to worse when Lucy started experiencing forgetfulness at a more and more frequent rate, followed by extended bouts of extreme depression. That's when doctors flabbergasted by the changes Lucy was going through, decided to scan her brain which revealed a huge lesion on her right frontal lobe. Now, on the one hand, this was good news for Lucy's diagnosis since doctors had long suspected the problem was at least somewhat cerebral. But on the other hand, it was incredibly likely that this was a tumor of some kind. So in June of that year, doctors decided to perform a biopsy on her brain to figure out exactly what was going on in Lucy's head. So there Lucy is on the operating table. I mean, can you imagine how terrifying this would have been for her, for her family? And like, it's just, wow, it's like a lot, right? She's given anesthesia while her head is placed into a sort of like head stabilizer device on the table to make sure that her head doesn't move. The coordinates for where the incision needs to be made are inserted into the stereotactic equipment. And then the staff proceeds to shave part of Lucy's head before drilling a small hole about the size of a dime to enter her brain. So this hole is then like held open with a pair of forceps. So the doctors can just like reach right in and carefully take what they need. Hold up, hold up. Okay, like I can't, I'm sorry. I can't say that without taking a moment. Like, can you imagine? Like it is absolutely wild to me that people figured out how to safely drill holes into skulls and like tinker around in there and just patch it up and send you on your way. It's Wild. Anyways, but here's the thing, my friends. After drilling in and doing all of this work, doctors didn't find a tumor inside of the lump in Lucy's head that day. Doctors actually didn't find anything they were looking for that day. But oh, they found something, honey. They found the source of the problem. It was a red string-like structure just over three inches long and about half an inch wide. Now for perspective, that's about as long and as wide as a popsicle stick. So just sitting there in Lucy's brain. And worse, y'all hang on to your ass, okay? That, <laughs> that three inch long red string thing, it was moving. <laughs> this was the moment doctors realized exactly what Lucy's problem was and what it had been for over a year. I just, y'all just, are you ready for this? Inside of Lucy's brain was an actual living worm. Oh, 
y'all. When I tell you that I about threw my laptop after reading this story, there was a worm, an actual living, moving worm, an Ophidescaris robertsi, AKA a sort of roundworm that is indigenous to Australia and grows inside of a large snake. Cause somehow that makes it better. But get this, the type of snake this roundworm grows inside, the carpet python. You know, those non-venomous snakes that I said Lucy had nothing to be afraid of. Yes, I sh you not. This just like blows my mind. It turns out Lucy had a reason to be afraid, not of the python. Oh no, it gets worse. She had to be afraid of the python's poop. Yeah, poop, snake sh for real. So these roundworms grow in eggs inside of the python's intestine and those eggs get expelled when the snake poops. Now this poop usually lands on plants and then the plants with eggs are usually eaten by smaller mammals and they grow into roundworms that literally eat the mammals alive from the inside out. What the f is happening? Mother nature, you freak me out. Like seriously, this story went from mother nature to mother f over some snake sh so the theory as it goes is that a snake pooped on some greens. Lucy then ate those greens. The eggs from those greens then traveled through Lucy's bowels, then into her body, then into her brain where a roundworm decided to live rent free off of her brain matter. Okay, still with me? Barely, yeah, well not to worry. There is a silver lining to all of this. Now, although the Cleveland Clinic states that roundworms infect hundreds of millions of people, Globally, this is actually the first time ever that this specific roundworm has ever infected a human. And unfortunately for Lucy, the likeliest reason she has the distinction of being the first ever is the result of a simple lesson she ignored. Maybe even just this once that she didn't apparently properly clean her, either her greens, her hands or both before eating. Scott Gardner, a prof Gardner, a professor, okay, I got, I got you. Scott Scott Gardner, a professor of biological sciences at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, straight up said that people shouldn't panic about being infected by these things. Quote, a lot of the parasites that can affect people do so because we get in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we ingest some eggs that aren't supposed to come into us. And if we're immunocompromised, then we can have a pretty serious infection. Wait, hold up. Okay, Mr. Gardner, professor, professor. Can someone tell me how that quote is supposed to not make you panic? Professor, I don't think that these words are giving what you think they're giving. You say it, it could be really bad for people who are immunocompromised, which means it could be really bad for some people. I'm just, I thought I'd point that out, but I'm not a doctor, so y'all just don't, whatever. I don't know what I'm talking about. So the question is how did this get by those first doctors? You'd think round worms would be pretty easy to find on an x-ray, right? Right? Well, according to Karina Kennedy, the director of microbiology at Canberra Hospital and one of the authors of the article about Lucy, Lucy's initial symptoms were, quote, likely due to migration of roundworm larva from the bowel and into other organs such as the liver and the lungs. But since these specific roundworms had never infected humans, quote, trying to identify the microscopic larva, which had never previously been identified as causing human infection, was a bit like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I feel better already. <laughs> So Lucy got a lot of good news and bad news out of this. The bad news was that she obviously had a f***ing worm in her brain, but also that her forgetfulness and depression remained six months after the extraction. Now, thankfully she was able to head home after a while and is on the fast track to recovery, also being placed on medication to kill any other worm larva burrowing into her bones and organs. The doctors all believe that Lucy will very likely make a full recovery, but are still flummoxed by the first time discovery of a parasitic 
brain worm like this. Now, since Lucy has remained anonymous throughout all of this and she went through a nasty ordeal, I, I, I refuse to judge Lucy, but unless doctors have overlooked some kind of potential third party reason for this to have happened, such as somebody else mishandling greens to feed Lucy, then there might just be a simple takeaway from this story that I hope we could all hold near and dear. Please wash your damn hands. Like I'm not messing around with no worms. This thing was as long and wide as a popsicle stick. I am never going to the ice cream man again. Now imagine one of those in your head, only instead of sour candy dust, it has teeth. And instead of you eating the delicious sour candy dust, it's eating delicious brain matter. That's disgusting. Wash your hands. Okay, that's what I got out of the sus pool with you. Grab a towel, dry off. We had a nice little swim. I have a brand new full deep dive documentary out on my main channel, Swoop. It is linked below. Make sure you check it out. Make sure also to subscribe to this new channel right here and turn on all your notifications so you don't miss a single creepy spooky story. Also follow me on Instagram and Twitter. That's where you can catch me daily with life things. Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Be sure to tap the link in the description and use code SWOOP255 to get 55% off Scentbird or scan the QR code here to get 55% off your first month and treat yourself to the self-care you deserve, honey. All right, y'all be creepy, stay weird, and I will see you next time in the cesspool. Swoop!